morning's lesson in a perpetual covenant. In today's society, the word covenant is rarely used outside of marriage. The entire idea of covenant is a foreign concept in our culture. Even, even the marriage covenant is misunderstood. A covenant is not a contract. When Wendy and I signed the paperwork on our house, the representative from the title company told us that each paper we had to sign represented a, a way that previous borrowers or lenders had cheated the other party. And as a result, more paperwork had to be created to ensure that it was understood that these things were not acceptable. A contract is designed to protect both parties from each other since both are making the agreement in hopes of receiving more than they're willing to give. Those who enter a marriage with this mindset are setting themselves up for failure from the very beginning. Yes. A covenant is based on the idea that each party wants what's best for the other. Each one looks out for the other and does their best to ensure the safety and security of the other. A covenant focuses on the mutual benefit at any cost to self. A contract is for those who believe the other person will fall short of their expectations. A covenant is for those who intend to do more than what they promise, regardless of the behavior of the other party. If a covenant is broken, the one who has been offended will do his best to restore the relationship to its original terms. In a, a contract, is based on mistrust, while a covenant is based on love and mutual respect. I hope that I'm effectively conveying the difference between these two, because they are very different things. If there's any question about the truth of what I've said, we have the entire history of the Bible to back it up. Of course, in every covenant with God, humanity is the party who always falls short. And God invariably reaches out to restore the situation for our benefit. Even as he cut off the Jews as a nation, he never forsook them as individuals, but made opportunity for them to return to him if they would only choose to do so. God will not fail us, but we certainly have the potential to fail him. It's our responsibility to acknowledge this potential and seek reconciliation when we fail. This is our part in any covenant, but especially in our covenant with God, since He's given us far more than any of us could ever deserve in order to make a way for us to, to escape the destination of those who refuse His love and mercy and continually go in their own direction. The commentary this morning, God has dealt with man by covenant ever since He was created. While a covenant is generally the result of a mutual agreement between certain parties, a covenant with God is one which He originates and offers to man. If man accepts that covenant and keeps it, he will reap the promises and benefits which God offered with it. Some of those in the Old Testament with whom God made covenants were Noah, Abraham, Moses, Joshua, and Israel. Covenants with the tribe of Levi, Phinehas, and David, Jehoiada, Hezekiah, Josiah and Ezra. In a key verse, they shall ask the way to Zion with their faces thitherward, saying, Come and let us join ourselves to the Lord in a perpetual covenant that shall not be forgotten. Jeremiah 50 and 5. Any comments on this introductory section before we move into the lesson? It seems like today people see marriage as more of a contract. Right. People want to see what make the, make sure that they get the most out of it with with little concern for the other party. That that is totally a contract, and like I said, if if you go into a marriage with that mindset, there is very little hope of it uh, lasting. Anything else? Part one: God's covenant since creation. Part A: God's first covenant with man. Genesis two seventeen. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. 
God's first covenant with man was broken and resulted in the condemnation of the entire human race. Man was created in the image of God, according to Genesis 1.27, as a moral, moral being with feelings and a capacity for love, a reflection of the sacred character and holy personality of God. The source of human corruption is not to be found in the will or the purpose of God, but in the rebellious heart of man himself. For God made him without sin and established him in a perfect setting. God's covenant included a command for man to not do a certain thing, forbidding his eating of the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The sin was in the eating and not the fruit itself, since eating the fruit of the tree was disobedience to God who commanded that the fruit of that tree was not to be eaten. One could say that the tree was a sign or a symbol of what the law required, a concrete representation of the difference between right and wrong. Its presence in the garden gave man a choice which was necessary to allow him free will. Without the opportunity to choose, man could not be said to be free. Now we see God's mercy as clear as, clear evident, as clearly evidenced by this account. God only wanted what was best for His most prized creation. But He also wanted us to love Him and choose to, and love Him by choice. By definition, love has to be by choice. You can't force somebody to love you. If you force someone to love you, that's not love. That's could be described as lots of things, but love is not one of those things. That required an option other than obedience. There had to be an option for these two to choose in order to show their love and appreciation to God. Even though he knew that man would fail, he gave us the choice, not only to give us the freedom to choose him, but also to to reveal to us the depth of His love for us. Without our own failures, we could not fully understand the mercy of God. We could recognize the depth that we couldn't even recognize the depth of His love for us. But He allows us to fail Him because He knows we'll also fail each other. And He wants us to respond to one another's failures in the same way that He responds to our failures. Certainly the process of death was a result of that first sin, but a substitution was provided to, to remove the immediacy and grant us an opportunity to witness the seriousness of disobedience. Now, I've, I've mentioned this before, I don't know that anybody's heard it, but the animals that were killed in their place, they were likely well known to Adam and Eve. They probably knew these animals. They may have been like pets. Adam had named all the creatures after all and these would certainly have been among those whom Adam named. I imagine these animals standing between God and the first two humans. I imagine them, I imagine them asking God to have mercy on these two and accept their blood in the place of Adam and Eve's. Consider the sadness of these first two humans as they realized that their failure had cost these two beautiful animals their lives. Then think about how the covering of their skins would have been a daily reminder of their own failure and the great cost that it required. God restored their relationship to himself, but the cost of that failure was high. Our dis disobedience brings pain and suffering upon us, but it also stands as a barrier between ourselves and the God who loves us so much that He was willing to die in our place that we might experience life with Him in eternity. This pain that we experience is an important part of the covenant God has made with us. It should be a daily reminder of how far He was willing to go in order to make a way for us that would be worth far more than we could ever endure in this life. Obedience is worth whatever it may cost for the great love that God has bestowed upon us. And he, I'm going I'm to hold off on the comments here and <laughs> get, get through this section just, just to make sure we have time. Part B, God made a covenant with Noah. 
Genesis 9, 13, I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. Following the abating of the flood and the departure from the ark, Noah built an altar for sacrifice. And God said to Noah, And I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood. Neither shall there be any more, any more be a flood to destroy the earth. Genesis 9 and 11. God takes the initiative and declares his purpose of mercy and grace to the inhabitants of the world. In addition to this, we read in Genesis 8.21 that God removed the curse on the ground which had been initiated at the time of the fall. We often overlook this fact. The sign of the rainbow is confirmation of his divine intent to deal mercifully with the human race. The pulpit commentary quotes Wordsworth in, his, in its mention of, the, of verse 13. The bow in the hands of man was an instrument of battle. But the bow bent by the hand of God has become a symbol of peace. And we are reminded of God's everlasting covenant each time we see a rainbow. That God initiates the covenant is evident by His mercy and grace. Since there is nothing that can force Him to enter into a covenant relationship with man. He spoke to Abraham as Yahweh, the covenant God who initiates and fulfills the covenants which He has made. When Abraham was old, God spoke to him. And when Abraham was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect, and I will make my covenant between me and thee, and will multiply thee exceedingly. This is my covenant, which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised. Genesis 17, 1, 2, and 10. As a sign of the covenant that God had with Abraham and his seed, the rite of circumcision was instituted. It denoted separation unto God, purity in him, possession by him, and was a sign of the people's commitment to him. Now each time a covenant was instituted or renewed, it was a reminder of God's great love for all humanity. Whenever trials came upon man in, our, in the Old Testament, it was a reminder of our human tendency toward failure and an indication of what we can expect as a result of our own disobedience. God rarely actually has to punish us. The simple outcome of our own selfish will is the cause of most of the heartache among humanity. God doesn't have to do that. We do that to ourselves by ignoring His will. For the most part, if God has told us to do something a certain way, it's because He knows what will happen if we don't. Not because He's waiting to put some kind of pain on us, but because He understands the end result of our actions, of our words, of our behavior. We may not concern ourselves with the consequences at the time, but we will understand soon enough if we refuse His guidance. God has no pleasure in our suffering. If He did... He wouldn't have bothered to show us the way we should go in the first place. He would just let us figure it out on our own. But because of His love for us, for all of us, is so great, His desire is to lead us in the way that will cause the least damage to ourselves and to one another. This is what He does to show us that He is sincere in fulfilling His portion of the covenant. Part C, Israel and, and God's covenant, Exodus 24, 3, 7, and 8. And when, he, and when she could no longer hide him, she took, him from, took for him an ark of bulrushes and daubed it with slime and with pitch and put the child therein, and she laid it in the flags by the brink, river's brink. Then said his sister to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call to thee a nurse of the Hebrew women that she may nurse the child for thee? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go, and the maid went and called the child's mother. Of course, we're talking about Moses here. <laughs> there any question. In Exodus 18, we note the wisdom of Jethro who advised Moses of the system of government that would relieve Moses of much of the work of governing the people. Jethro further advised Moses to deal with the Godward part of the government, serving as mediator and returning the words of the Lord to the people concerning the way wherein they must walk and the work they must do, Exodus 18 and 20. Excuse me. The Lord spoke to Moses at Sinai, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the, chil excuse me, tell the children of Israel, Now therefore, 
If you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people. For the earth is mine, and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. Exodus 19, 3, 5, and 6. And he took the book of the covenant and read it in the audience of the people. And they said, All that the Lord hath said we will do and be obedient. And Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant which the Lord hath made with you concerning all these words. Exodus 24, 7, and 8. This covenant was entered into by each individual who pledged himself to be faithful to those things which God had spoken through Moses. I just uh, pause here for a second. I don't have this in my notes, but as I was reading, I realized it says, uh, and Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people. Part of a biblical covenant was um, something that, that we don't read a lot about, but part of this covenant practice in the Old Testament was you would kill several animals, and literally cut them in half, put one half on either side and make a, a pathway in between them. And each member of the covenant, I think Abraham, uh, there's, a, there's a portion where Abraham, God makes, made the covenant with Abraham and he went into a deep sleep. Uh, we see this as what happened and this is, it's not explained as such, but this is what makes a covenant. And each party of the covenant would walk down the path in between the midst of these slaughtered animals and say, basically, if I don't do what I say, may this be done to me. Uh, so that's when, when Moses says he took the blood of the covenant, blood and sprinkled all the people, that's, that's what he's talking about. That blood may be unto me if, if I don't do these things. So when they said, all the Lord hath said, we will do and be, be obedient, they were saying, if we don't, this blood that you're sprinkling on us, it's going to end up being our blood. And we see that that's, that's pretty much what happened when they, when they continually failed to recognize God's will. Now the blood was a reminder to them of the seriousness of the covenant with God that they were entering into. It showed the price for disobedience was death. The sacrificial system that would be instituted should have stood as a daily reminder of God's mercy and the high price of disobedience. God's love for His people was so great that He did not want their human predisposition towards sin to destroy them. He did everything short of forcing obedience upon, up to uphold His part of the covenant. We tell children not to run with scissors, not to touch the hot stove, not to play in traffic, not to eat too many sweets. We tell them to do their homework, to eat their vegetables, to do their chores, to bathe regularly. Why do we do this? Because having more experience in these matters, we know what's likely to happen if they disobey. Are we mean for giving children these instructions? Are we to blame if they get hurt or become unhealthy or fail a test, etc., because we've given them these instructions? No. Those are just some of the results, the immediate results of disobedience in these situations. We didn't cause the pain. We didn't cause the failure. We warned the children what would happen if they didn't obey and the, the pain, the failure, the, the difficulty was a direct result of their disobedience. It wasn't punishment. If we know these things concerning children, how much more should we be not just willing, but hungry to seek out the will of God and do it in all things, understanding the eternal benefits that, that obedience holds? I think if you run with scissors, you might not fall and stab yourself. That's, that's pretty nice. If you don't touch the hot stove, you won't get burned. If you do your homework and study, you might not fail that test. But if we fail to recognize obedience to God, the di direct results, not the punishment, but the direct results of our actions or inactions have the potential to be eternal in nature. If we suffer for our disobedience, God isn't being mean to us. 
We're just experiencing the natural outcome of our actions just like that child who touched the hot stove against the will of his parents. It's never a parent's will for their child to be hurt. Parents do all they can to protect their children from these kinds of things. But if the child goes outside of the will of their parents, it's not the parent's fault when the child gets hurt. And it's not God's fault when we suffer for our disobedience. Any thoughts on part one here before we move on? Part two, flawed presumptions about church membership, Acts 2, 47. Praising God and having favor with all the people and Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. The belief that an individual is not born into the church is inseparably bound to the covenant of membership and the foundation of these beliefs is, is and must be fixed firmly upon the scriptures and not upon man's mythical systems. The holy scriptures do not teach that the act makes makes one a that sorry the holy scriptures do not teach that the act which makes one a christian christian also results in their becoming a member of the church though many sincere people have been taught and firmly believe this but one receiving salvation and two becoming a member of the body of christ represent two altogether different happenings while a person who is born again has been forgiven of his transgressions and is justified in the sight of God, that person does not automatically become a member of the body of Christ, the church. This is more clearly understood if one has a revelation of the spiritual, invisible nature of the kingdom of God as compared with the visible, physical nature of the church. We can see these separate events represented in two states, one which is spiritual and invisible, the other being physical and visible. Jesus made it clear to Nicodemus that except man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God, John 3 and 3. And part of his explanation or response to Nicodemus' question was, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That is to say it's visible, it's physical. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. That is to say it's invisible, it's spiritual, verse 6. While Jesus made it clear that we are born into the kingdom of God, the word also makes it quite evident that some other action is involved to enter the church. A direct comparison appears in John's third epistle, verses 9 and 10, where some of the faithful brethren, Christians, had been cast out of the church by an unfaithful minister, Diotrephes, thus demonstrating that it is possible to be saved and not be a member of the church. In Jude 4 we read, For there are certain men crept in unawares, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men. If a person is born into the church, then Jude was mistaken when he said that ungodly men were able to creep in. And Paul was also in error when he instructed the church at Corinth to gather themselves and put away, together and put away from among yourselves that wicked person. Uh, see, first, that's uh, 1 Corinthians 5, 4 through 13. Paul's writing in 1 Corinthians 12 and 13 has been erroneously interpreted by sincere people to mean that water baptism makes one a member of the church. But water baptism is the answer of a good conscience toward God, 1 Peter 3 and 21, and a public acknowledgement of the inward spiritual experience of new birth. Now another wonderful analogy that I've heard is very beneficial in understanding the difference between being saved and becoming a member of the church. I think the lesson kind of touches on this later, but I want to go into just a little bit more depth. Salvation is described by Jesus as being born again. Now, birth is a process of separation. It's a coming out. Just as the exodus was an analogy of salvation, since the children of Israel were coming out of Egyptian bondage. This coming out did not make them the church in the wilderness, as Stephen described them later, their later state in Acts 7.38. That didn't happen until the covenant was proposed and accepted in chapter 24 of Exodus. When they accepted this covenant, they came into agreement with God and with one another to be His people. Becoming a part of God's church is an entering into a new chapter of life as a covenant member of God's singular organization. By the covenant, 
those who already believe come into agreement with God and with one another that they will cooperate under the proposed government of God to encourage and strengthen each other in their accountability to God. The new birth is coming out of our sinful past. Church membership is coming into the safety of the one fold. This is how Jesus was able to say in John 10, 16, And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring in. And they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. If salvation were the same as church membership, there would be no other sheep for Jesus to bring into his one fold. If all saved individuals were automatically church members, how could there be other sheep? to be brought into the one fold, as, as Jesus said. But Jesus made it clear that there were those who needed to be brought into the safety of His one fold then, and the same applies today. The same is true now. Any thoughts, comments here on this section? Right. Right. If they've not seen the truth, if they've not seen it in God's Word, then they're not responsible for that. Right. And uh, later on, it says those that will come in. Mm -hmm. too, right. Uh, we could probably, and we probably do hurt other people by, you know, when they're not ready and saying that mm -hmm. they need to be ready or they're sinning or they're not obeying God for not. Being members of the church. Being members of the church, it could actually hurt them when, or that they are saints in their own way right, right now. And if we pray and ask the Lord to lead those people, again, I'm of a mindset, if God does not tell you to go to them, don't go stir up a nest. Right. Because if you don't have, if you're a beekeeper, even the beekeepers I know, they dress the part and they get there and do stuff before they disturb the nest. <laughs> we got to make sure that when we go and, quote, disturb the nest, you we're, know, we've we're got properly God prepared, yeah. We're properly prepared <laughs> for what God would have us to say to Right. Them. But we have to realize that there are people out there that are saved. Absolutely. That are serving the Lord the best way they know and right. what they've seen in Scripture and been taught. Mm hmm. And in time, God will lead those true sheep mm -hmm. <clears throat> to the church. And just like we've got sheep in the church now that are not true sheep, mm -hmm. it works both ways. Yes, yes, indeed. And it could be somebody that's put on the face of a sheep who is really together. Right. And I believe God allows those people in. <clears throat> the devil sends them, God allows them in for whatever purpose that they serve. For a moment. Mm -hmm. But we have to always keep in mind, keep that an open thing. Absolutely. So people that say, oh, well, they're, they're wearing jewelry now. They're doing this. They're doing that. Huh. we got to look to the Lord. And when the Lord reveals things to different people, that's when. We're responsible. That's when, that's when in their life that they need to do whatever God tells them to do. Mm -hmm. We're, we're responsible for what we know. And there, there are many, I guarantee there are many out there today in, in churches all over this town who are hungry for the truth and they haven't received the fullness of it yet. But they will. It's our responsibility as Christians and as members of the Church of God to allow God the freedom to work through us as he will. As Wendy said, we have the potential to destroy uh, future church members before they even become members by our behavior. And it's our responsibility to recognize the will of God and not to condone sin. It's never our, our God's will for us to condone sin, but it is our God's will for us to recognize 
that there are those who don't have the fullness of that revelation. When uh, Peter acknowledged Jesus as the Christ, the Son of the living God, how did he come by that knowledge? Was it, was it something somebody told him? It was divine revelation. That's how we all grow. Sometimes we have the potential to be a part of that divine revelation. It's my deepest and most sincere desire as a teacher to, to stir up divine influence. Not that I have the power, but maybe God will give me something to say that will spark something in, in the heart and mind of somebody that will inspire them to have a deeper knowledge of the Word of God. That's what we need to pray for as as both saved individuals and as church members, for God to give us the wisdom to know what to say, how to say it, who to say it to, when to say it, and when to keep our mouth shut. Because speaking the truth is just as important as keeping our mouth shut, depending on the situation and the individuals involved. Yes? Mm -hmm. that I believe are very possibly other sheep. Yes, indeed. Um, they are a blessing to me, and I hope that Chris and I are a blessing to them. And we have one couple that any time <laughs> Chris or I or them need prayer, we go to yes. prayer before we start playing. Stop right there. We might be in the middle of a sentence, <laughs> and the lady, she says, well, let's go to prayer. And she grab our hands immediately. Just yes. let's pray. And Right. These are God's sheep, and if I was not doing what I do now, I would never have met these sheep. And I feel like it's a blessing. Absolutely. You know, we served our capacity as long as the Lord had us to at headquarters, about 10 years, 20 years of service, and we did what we could there. But I believe later in life, the Lord brought us to a place where we were also able to be a blessing and be blessed. And we need to, and I'm thankful for these souls. It's ironic. It's crazy that all the people that we, most of the people we claim for, there's a few that are um, different, but they all know each other one way or another. <laughs> you know, I'll say, you know, so-and-so, I'm like, oh, yeah, I went to church with them back. And they're just good people. And like I said, I believe that they are true sheep, and they, they take in their own covenant. I know that the church they're a part of, they agreed and they've had membership there at their local church um, but they don't know every, everything right you know their church left the way um, but they they believe in what their church is teaching them now and, and they're faithful the says, and, um, you can't find more better prayer no mm -mm. I don't, I don't know anybody in the church as faithful as, as Harvey Tillery. <laughs> but, but we love them and we know that, you know, God works on all of us. Right. Um, we still sing this, well, I... We don't sing it here recently. Sing it, but he's still working on me. I still sing that every now and then, and I learned that when I was three years old. Right. You know, he's still working on me and he's still working on everybody here that's still here. If you're alive and breathing... We have the potential for growth. Hope, but he's still working. Yes. He's still allowing to work. Praise the Lord. Anything else? Two things I think of. I had already studied this lesson to teach it for <laughs> last week. But two things. Um, in Matthew 28, go ye therefore and teach. Mm -hmm. Teach. That first teach mm -hmm. goes back in the dictionary to mean to disciple. 
Right, exactly. And what you're talking about, Brother Chris, is part of that discipling. Yes. Know when to speak. Right. Know when to teach, know when to preach, know when to just be there. Mm -hmm. And that is part of our commission as right. the church to do. We've got, the only way we can do that is to learn it for ourselves mm -hmm. and God give it to right. us divinely. Absolutely. That is what we are to do. And then the other thing I think about so often, we deal like you all do with a lot of precious mm. saints. Right. I'll call them saints. Yeah, absolutely. They're not a sinner. They're a saint. Right. But they're not in the church. Right. But if we both continue to go down the mm -hmm. same path in the word of God, looking for truth, mm -hmm. and honestly walking before the Lord, we're both going to end up in the same place. Right. At the same spot. Right. We're both going to end up under the covenant. I really appreciate what she said. Sometimes sometimes the most important thing, that sometimes the best thing we can do is simply listen. It's it's not always about the words that we speak. Sometimes it's it's important for us to recognize God's will in, in just simply hearing the the heart of another individual. And, and if nothing else, taking taking what we hear to God. So we don't always have all the answers. I want to always have all the answers. I want to. But I know I don't. And so sometimes it's just my responsibility as, as a teacher to listen. Because sometimes listening to those who are in the congregation, I, I receive a, a far greater knowledge, far greater inspiration, far greater uh, divine revelation by teaching because of what I receive as a teacher from those I'm trying to inspire. Yes. In the church, out of the church. It don't <laughs> know by their fruit. You can learn people by the fruit that Yes. That yes. You learn the bad of people and their fruit. The old lady the other day I went talking about, she was furious over her order. I mean, absolutely furious and used so many words that, and she just threw it all out on the counter. Yeah. You know? Yep. Then you <clears throat> see people that are sweet and it'll take on where, oh, that's okay, you know, if I order that, you know. But you see different people's fruit all the mm -hmm. time. And, of course, only God can judge that fruit, but you can tell when someone's really wanting to do the best they can mm -hmm. and the fruit that they, you know, produce. And I, and I want to always produce good right. fruit. Even if they put lettuce on my <laughs> Not me. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, I'll be nice and talk to people, but I just couldn't that day. And yeah. I was like, the Lord just kept my mouth shut. Like, you know, and so, but we know people by their fruit. Yeah, I, I, that's, that's wonderful. I, thank you. I, I believe you were at uh, Captain D's. Yeah, that's what it reminds me. I, I, thought, I, I was sitting here thinking, I bet Christine's thinking about that. It, she was dealing with an individual who was... Uh, very, very, was it you or was it your it sister? sister? Okay, Elaine. I was dealing with a very uh, unpleasant individual at Captain D's. Uh, was it the manager who came up? Yeah, supervisor. Supervisor? Uh, this I mean, like Wendy said, this individual was quite upset with her issue, whatever it was. And it was a Sunday afternoon, and the supervisor came up and, and asked, and uh, I'm supervisor, I just... Um, that's, that's a very Christian spirit you're showing. Would you mind telling me what ch church you're a member of? <laughs> that was the end of the argument. Because as Wendy said, she recognized her fruit. She recognized her own fruit. It took someone coming to her and saying, did she just walk away? Was that the end of the problem? She shut up and yeah. just waited for her food yeah. until it got corrected. <laughs> so. 
So that's, we need to be careful. But sinners can recognize that's, fruit too. The, that's the problem. I'm not sure that that supervisor was a Christian. I, I don't know. But whether they were or not, they recognized the fruit. That's exactly right. Ye shall be known <laughs> by your whoever. She didn't exactly say a member of what church. Yeah, she but, said you're showing a... Oh, oh yeah, that's right. That's right. You're, a, you're showing a wonderful Christian loving attitude. Yeah. Can you tell me what church you go to? Okay. That's We... Oh, yeah, so, I'm sure. I've, been, I've told one time when I had some shoes thrown at me, some boots. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> they walked out wow. the door and then they walked back in the door and they threw them at us and was like, stick the boots up here. And I'm like, hold up, hold up, wait a minute. There's no respect that way, sir. Come on now. That's very disrespectful. And that's, that makes me think I should have said, what? <laughs> what church? Where do you go to church? <laughs> <laughs> Praise the Lord. Yes, thank God. Part three. Let's see if I can get through this and maybe have a few more comments at the end. I'm not going to read this whole section. I hope everybody's read their Sunday school lessons. Good stuff in here. I will read the, the scripture to, uh, section scripture. Part three. Similarities of marriage, vow, and church covenant. Isaiah 62 and 5. For as a young man marrieth a virgin, so shall thy sons marry thee. And as the bridegroom rejoiceth over the bride, so shall thy God rejoice over thee. Just going to read this uh, very last sentence. The new convert is born into the kingdom, but by a, a separate act, the word covenant, the new convert is added to the church. This coming together needs to be understood in light of the definition of covenant as described in the introduction part of this lesson. We are in no danger of being double crossed by God. Not one of us, ever. Therefore, entry into the church is by covenant. This is important for us to understand. Once again, in a covenant, the parties state their desire to do whatever it takes to live up to their portion of the agreement, regardless of what the other party does. God is, I say that, other parties, because when we join the church, there are multiple parties. Not only are we joining ourselves with God, but we are joining ourselves with the, with the rest of the membership. So it should be our, our understanding when we enter into that covenant that regardless of what anybody around us does, yes. we're going to keep our part of the deal. God is truly bearing the full weight of this covenant since we are the only ones who have the potential to fall short of our end of the deal, on our end of the deal. Yet He accepts us as if He knew we would never fail, even if He knows that we're going to. Even if he knows that we will eventually and eternally reject him, he accepts us. If we come up short, he will do everything he can to restore us to his loving care. If we see others coming up short, it's our, not our responsibility to ignore the problem until they fail, nor is it our responsibility to condemn them. We are all covenant together for our mutual benefit. If we have come together for our, we have come together for our mutual benefit. We are called to bear one another's burdens. We are called to lift up the hurting wherever they may be found. The covenant we took binds us together as brothers and sisters to encourage and to strengthen one another. I saw a foot race recently where the, the three leaders were well far ahead of everybody else. Just before the finish line, that number one runner fell stumbled and fell. The second and third place runners saw that the runner was injured and having trouble getting up, so they went to her and lifted her up and helped her to cross the finish line first, gladly taking second and third place. This should be our experience in the church. Whether you're the one who fall, who's fallen or the one you see 
Are you the one who has seen somebody else fall? If this hasn't been our, our experience, then it's our opportunity to take the part of the second and third place runners and help someone else. Our response to others should never be determined on how people have treated us, but on how Jesus was willing to die in our place. This should be the attitude of a true covenant member of the church of God. Any comments here? Hey. Well, too bad for her. I mean, go ahead and go. Sadly, my experience in the church has been exactly that. When whether whether I'm the one who's hurting or I've seen others who have been hurt, I, I've seen people run all over people trying to get ahead of them, and we shouldn't. We should as as humans. Forget Christians. Forget church members. As humans. We should have more compassion on one another than that. Sadly, I have seen the people kicked out more than I have seen them help. Uh, absolutely, yes. And that's you know, people, a sad state. They say riding on the altar, you know, sometimes. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, they're still trying to make it to the finish line. They're mm -hmm. on the altar. They may be stumbling, but they know where to go for help. And I, I praise the Lord for, for people like, Aaron Barrows. And not everybody knows him and his past. I'm looking around here. I don't think anybody here knows him like Wendy and I know him. He spent years, literally every Sunday, he was at the altar trying before he finally just left altogether. But there were people praying for him. There were people praying for his wife for 17 years, prayed for them. And they were out of the church. And we got to see him on several occasions, and we encouraged him. And I know that others in the church did as well. I know he came to headquarters on many occasions, just covered in tattoos and, and crying because he knew where he needed to be, and he just couldn't get back. And I remember him coming back. And since then, he, he, he's been one of the most faithful and sincere servants of God that I've known in my entire life. We can't give up on people. We can't just push them aside. We can't ignore their hurt. If we see someone hurting, we don't need to condemn them because we see fruit that's not becoming of an individual. We need to lift them up and help them. We need... That's part of that stumbling in that race. It, that's, that's part of that stumbling that we are all potential to be a part of as humans. We may not even recognize our own stumblings. Oftentimes we don't. That's, that's the power of the enemy. He, he wants to deceive us. I, I read recently and I posted on Facebook, it's far easier to deceive people than it is to convince them that they've been deceived. I couldn't find a, an individual who actually said that. I couldn't find where that, that, that source for that quote. But I don't think anything's ever been said that's more true of the state of humanity. It's easy for us to be deceived. <laughs> Look at the political world. I'm not talking about one or the other. I'm talking about the political world, all of them, every one of them. It's not their desire to fulfill our wishes regardless of who they are. It's their desire to deceive us long enough to get that position that they want. That's all they care about. It doesn't matter. And when we see that in our leadership, we have a tendency to follow suit. And, and we see that going on in our nation today. We see that same kind of behavior. But we're talking about covenants here. And that covenant that we took with God to be a part of this church. We need to understand God's got his part taken care of. He's going to be the one who picks us up no matter what. But we have to be willing to be lifted. We have to be willing to recognize that we have fallen. Because a lot of time people don't even recognize that they've come short 
in their own eyes. They can't see it. But it's our responsibility to help them because we've come in together with one another to be the church of God. That doesn't mean, and when Paul says we're in a race, that doesn't mean that we're to shove each other out of the way to get to first place. Now that, <laughs> that, that I was talking about, those three girls running across the finish line, helping first place, that's what it means to run the race. It's not important who comes in first because fact of the matter is that first place finish, that's long ago. <laughs> the, the race for them is long over. Adam, Eve, all those hundreds of millions of billions of people who have gone before us in this world and made it, they finished the race ahead of us. And if we're looking at it from the world's perspective, they've already won. What's the point in us trying? But this race isn't about, this is more like a marathon. It doesn't matter who comes in first. You come in first, excellent. It, it, it's, what's important is that you finish. You finish the race. You cross that finish line. Don't take a to tour somewhere else. That's, what, that's what's important. And as covenant members of the church of God, it's our responsibility to be a blessing one to another and encourage one another and strengthen one another so that we can all finish this race together. Because if one of us fails, then we've all failed. We've failed to lift that one up. I, I can't do anything for the people at Zion Hill. I can pray for them. If I talk to them, I see them, I can, I can encourage them. But my responsibility here is here at this local church. And if, if any of you fail and I just watch you or shove you out the door, then I've failed. It's our responsibility to, if we have to delay our crossing of the finish line to help someone else to make it, it'll be worth it. It'll definitely be worth it.